signal. Welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone who is logging on to join us tonight for this virtual town hall meeting. Uh, we will be beginning in just about a minute. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kent Bug. I'm the superintendent of schools at Cole City School District. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining us for this virtual town hall meeting. Uh, the purpose of our meeting tonight is to present to you a draft of our school district's return to school plan. Um, board consideration of this plan will take place on July the 20th, so nothing is final until the Board of Education takes action. Uh, my goal for tonight in the next hour is to present our return to school plan to you and provide the public with an opportunity to submit questions. Uh, you should have received via email from the school district a link to a form that you can submit questions. Many of the questions that have submitted have been submitted previously. Uh, I will be addressing in the presentation, but obviously you are free to continue to submit questions. If you didn't get that link, it's on our website and also on our Facebook page. Um, so we encourage you to do that. If I cannot get to everyone's question tonight uh, that you submit, we will put together an FAQ document that will be posted on our school district website uh, following this presentation. Um, obviously, I would always prefer to hold these town hall meetings in person, uh, like we have done in the past when the tornadoes hit or when we uh, were looking to pass a school referendum, but obviously state guidelines don't allow us to host a large group in one room at this time. So hopefully uh, this is a way that we can reach a lot of our uh, constituents in the community, a lot of our parents, and explain not only what our plan looks like, but a little bit about the process we went through and how we arrived at the recommendation that we plan to make to the Board of Education on July the 20th. Just a brief history, um, I'm sure all of you remember it well, but on Tuesday, March the 17th, we received word from uh, the state of Illinois that schools across Illinois had to shut down due to COVID-19. At that point, we had no idea how long we were going to be closed down, and we soon learned that that was going to be for the rest of the spring, and we had a remote learning environment for the rest of the spring. Our school district actually started our transition planning for this coming school year, in mid-May. On June 17th, we formalized our transition planning to prepare for the expectation that if we came back to school in the fall, it would be with restrictions. Um, on that document that guided our transition planning process, we had over 60 school district stakeholders involved in the district's transition planning. Uh, committee, we tried to find committee members with dual roles, such as uh, picking teachers on the committee that were also parents or parents that were also community leaders or grandparents that were also community leaders, parents that were also support staff, parents that were also organizational leaders such as involved with PromFest or PSO. Um, so we had, we had a lot of people involved and they spent a lot of time this summer uh, working on getting this plan together. Uh, we had uh, seven different committees that were part of our transition planning process. We had a transition planning oversight team, a teaching and learning committee, a health and wellness committee, a facilities and operations committee, a pre-K through five planning committee, a six through 12 planning committee, and a citizens advisory committee. And I really appreciate all the people that served on that committee because I think it's easy to understand they really had an impossible task. Um, 
they were charged with trying to do something, trying to make everyone happy with a plan that they put together. And I think we all know that given the current parameters and the current situation uh, with the pandemic and the state mandates, it is not going to be possible for us to put together a plan that makes everyone 100% happy. What we are trying to do is come up with a plan that meets the most needs of our community and parents and students that we possibly can. So knowing that they were charged with this virtually impossible task, we ask our committee members to let the following three guideline or guiding principles govern their discussions and their resulting recommendations. Those three guiding principles were number one, what is best for the academic growth of our students? Number two, what is best for the mental and physical health and safety of our students and staff? And third, what is realistic given the logistical mandates that we've received from the state? On June the 23rd, we received a document from the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Department of Public Health entitled, Starting the 2021 School Year. Uh, this was a 60 page document and in that document, first and foremost, we learned that as long as our region stays in phase four, we are able to offer in-person learning, which was very exciting for us. We're all excited to get our kids back to school. However, it's important to note that in those guidelines, they stated that there are five mandates that all school districts have to follow if they want to have in-person learning. And I understand that the most controversial of those is requiring face coverings to be worn by everyone in the school. Um, when we first received the guidance, we were on ISB, the Illinois State Board of Education webinars, and they had told us that uh, face shields were going to be okay, and we were excited about that. We soon learned that the State Board was not going to allow that, so face coverings have to be worn by everyone in the school, a face covering that covers the mouth and the nose. We are prohibited from having more than 50 individuals in one space. We are also required to social distance as much as possible, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. We are also required to conduct symptom screenings and temperature checks for everyone that comes into the school, or we are required that individuals self-certify that they are free of symptoms before they enter the school building. We're still waiting for further guidance on what the self-certification process might look like, and we will share that whenever that becomes available. We are also required to increase school-wide cleaning and disinfection. This is one of the reasons that the Board of Education approved hiring five more custodians in our district so that we can have another custodian working during the day at all five of our schools to increase uh, school-wide cleaning. I think it's very important to understand, and, and like I said, I understand that people have concerns with the face mask mandate. Our local Board of Education does not have the authority not to follow those mandates. And by not following those mandates, they would put our school district at extreme risk of liability. So just like we have done, we are gonna to continue to follow the guidance from the State Board of Education, from the Illinois Department of Public Health. And that is one of the mandates that we are required to follow. Um, that is once again, we understand and appreciate that face mask concern that some may have, which is why later on when I explain the plan, uh, we are providing a full remote option if you are a parent and have concerns with your child wearing a face mask at school. Um, also important to realize that the ISBE and Illinois Department of Public Health guidance provided numerous other recommendations in addition to these mandates. Our committees did a wonderful job of including those recommendations when appropriate for our district. As our committees continued their work, there were three consistent themes that continually arose from their committee conversations. One, as long as our school district's region is in phase four of the Restore Illinois plan, we all wanted some form of in-person learning to resume. We wanted our students back in school. Everyone agreed with that. We also, the, a consistent theme was given the uncertainty of the current environment, parents and guardians should be provided with as much choice as possible in regards to the education of their children. 
I've received emails over the past couple of weeks on both sides of the issue. Parents that believe that we should have school all day, parents who believe we shouldn't be having school at all. Um, we wanna provide parents and guardians with as much choice, as much control as possible on the decision they make for the education of their child. The third theme that came up is given the uncertainty of the current environment, we have to have the ability as a school district to pivot quickly from in-person learning to a full remote learning environment. I'm gonna to explain to you the plan that we have today based on us being in phase four. If for some reason our region moves back to phase three, we are not allowed in phase three to have in-person instruction. So we will have to be able to pivot back to remote instruction. And in all of our discussion, that's been an important uh, variable that we've made sure to consider. So based on the three consistent themes that came up and the three guiding principles, there are two major recommendations in our return to school plan that came from each committee. Recommendation number one was to adopt a hybrid model of instruction that includes both an in-person and remote learning component for all students. That hybrid model that's being recommended would be four hours of in-person instruction and one hour of remote instruction daily. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. The second recommendation that came from the committee and it aligns back to providing our parents as many choices as possible, everyone agreed that we should provide a full remote learning option for any student who wants it, any parent who decides that's what's best for their child. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute as well. So let me talk a little bit more in depth about the hybrid model and what it looks like for in-person instruction. Remember the three guiding principles and the three consistent themes that develop from our committees. We wanna do what's best for our kids. We also have to do what's best for their health and safety. And we have to consider the logistical issues that the state mandates might cause for us. So, one of the things that we wanted to do in this hybrid model, like I said, is provide as much parent choice as possible during these anxious and uncertain times. So for example, if you want your child to have in-person instruction, our plan accommodates that for at least a portion of the day. If you want your child to have full remote because you're uncomfortable for whatever reason sending them to school right now, our plan accommodates that. If you're not sure right now and you wanna see how it goes, you wanna start your child in school, and you think that after a couple of weeks, you see how it goes and you want them to go full remote, you have that ability. We're not telling you that you have to make a choice now and that choice is what you have to live with for the rest of the semester. Um, if you need full day for childcare reasons, I'm gonna talk about childcare in a little bit. We have a plan to accommodate that. If you're concerned about your child wearing a face mask for seven hours a day, our plan tries to help with that by cutting that down to four hours a day and in that four hour day, providing a couple breaks for our students to be able to remove their masks when they go outside. If you're concerned about your child wearing a face mask for even four hours, our plan accommodates that by giving you a full remote option for your child. So we tried to accommodate as many parental needs as possible in this plan. Our hybrid model allows for daily in-person instruction while also recognizing the health, safety, and the logistical issues present in the full day model. Like I said, we, we have concerns. Our educators have concerns with our students wearing face masks for seven hours a day. Um, we are worried how, whether our kids are really still gonna be able to pay attention, especially our younger ones at, in the afternoon after they've been wearing their face masks all day. So the four hour, in person allows the face mask to be worn for a much shorter period of time and we can hopefully build in some breaks for the students. Lunch is a big logistical issue for us. We are limited to only 50 students in a space for lunch because um, kids can't wear face masks at lunch so we have to keep the kids six feet apart. So that becomes a logistical issue. We have cleaning requirements where we need our custodians to be able to get into our buildings, into our classrooms earlier and conduct the necessary cleaning. Also, very importantly, if we are going to accommodate a full remote learning option for our parents that desire that for their students, 
one of the considerations that we have to have is when are our teachers going to have the ability to facilitate that remote learning? We can't ask our teachers to teach full day in-person learning and then deal with the remote learning all night. So this schedule allows us to accommodate in-person learning and gives our staff the afternoon to be able to further address any remote learning responsibilities that they have. Um, Childcare, when we met with the Citizens Advisory Committee, the only concern that they had with the hybrid model was parents that need childcare for their students. We are going to try to accommodate that. Um, if you need childcare for your student in the afternoon, we are going to try to accommodate that by offering that within our school. Um, as I said, we can have up to 50 students in a single space. So in the afternoon, when other students go home, if you need childcare, and we're gonna offer this K through eight, if you need childcare, we will have people supervising and be able to put up to 50 students in a gymnasium. So at the middle school, we can house up to 100 students who may need childcare. Um, at the intermediate school, we have two gyms. We can house up to 100 students that still need childcare. And the same rules will apply. They'll have to wear face masks. We'll try to keep them socially distanced, but they will be supervised by our faculty or our staff. Um, so there's gonna be more to come on that, more information to you. We understand the childcare issue and we wanna to try to address that to the best of our ability. Um, I know that people have questions about lunches on a partial day schedule. We will still be serving grab and go lunches to our students. So uh, if your child has school from eight to noon and they wanna grab a lunch on their way home, they have the ability to grab the lunch and take it with them on the way home. If students are requesting or parents need childcare for their student, we will have grab and go lunches for them as well. And they will go to the gym and either sit in the bleachers or on the floor and be able to eat their lunch. Um, K through seven lunches will be delivered to the classrooms and eight through 12 lunch will be picked up in the cafeteria. So we're trying to address that issue. So that's a little bit of detail about what the hybrid model will look like. Every student that chooses in-person instruction will be at school for four hours in the morning, and then they will have one hour of daily remote learning in the afternoon that's facilitated by our teachers. So let me talk for a minute about the full remote learning option for parents that wanna choose that for their child. In our initial survey results that we sent out, if you remember the survey that you were sent, um, we received guidance from the state board on June 23rd. I believe we sent the survey to parents out on the 24th and said, given these five mandates, um, would you send your child to school or would you prefer a remote learning option? And remember, that's when we thought clear face shields were going to be allowable. We had 21% of our parents that said they wanted a full remote learning option for their child. And so that's a large number of our students. And I'm, I'm fairly certain that number would probably be a little bit bigger now that face shields are not an option. Um, we understand in our school district that this can be an anxious time for students and families. Um, we are not here to judge the personal situation of a family. If a family has a reason that they don't believe their child can come to school, whether that's they're worried about infection, whether they have somebody at home who's medically fragile, whether there are anxiety issues, we're not going to judge that. We want to be able to continue educating your child and the full remote learning option allows us to do that. Um, all of you may have your reasons on why you, you don't want to participate in in-person learning. We respect that. Um, we want to provide as much flexibility as possible. Um, importantly, and I've had a lot of questions on this, parents can move to remote learning at any time. If you want to start and see how in-person learning goes, and for whatever reason you become nervous, you can let us know that you want full remote learning now. And vice versa is true. I'm very, very hopeful that a lot of the people that choose remote learning for their child will realize we're doing a great job with our in-person learning with our kids. And after a week or two, if you wanna send your child back for in-person learning, that's great. We would love to have them back. Um, a couple important things though for parents that are considering a full remote learning option. 
it is going to look much, much different than it did last spring. The guidance we received from the state board last spring was to do no harm to students. No student's grade should drop. Let's try to offer some continuum of education to our students. And let's be, you know, let's understand this is a very difficult time for them. And let's try to get them through the end of the school year. The ISBE guidance on expectations is very different now. They are telling us that if we offer a remote learning experience to our students, it should be an equivalent experience to what students are receiving in the classroom. Therefore, the, everything that the kids do is gonna be graded. Due dates are going to be the same. If, the, if you're in an in-person geography class and you get an assignment on Monday that's due on Tuesday, if you're in full remote learning, you're gonna get that assignment on Monday, it's due on Tuesday as well. So we also, as a result, one of the uh, teaching and learning committee recommendations was is that any parent who chooses a remote learning, full remote learning for their student is going to be asked to sign a remote learning contract stating that you understand what those expectations are. It's also very important to understand our teachers will not be online at six, seven, eight o'clock at night to reteach a lesson. They will be teaching that lesson during the school day. So if remote learning is what you want for your student and you want us to continue educating your student, which we want to do, your student is going to have to be available during the school day because there may be times if we're having a US history lesson that the US history teacher sends a note out and says, hey, I need you to log in today. I'm live streaming this lesson. He's not going to present that lesson again at eight o'clock at night. So uh, there's gonna be more to come on the remote learning contract, but I wanna make sure our parents do understand if you choose that option, which we fully support, it is going to look much, much different. Another thing that is very important for our parents that are considering full remote learning to understand, the only reason full remote learning is being offered and is being recognized by the State Board of Education as student attendance is that we are in phase four of the Restore Illinois program. If our district or our region moves to phase five, phase five is full in-person instruction remote learning will, will most likely no longer be recognized by the state for student attendance. And we will not be offering it anymore if we move to phase five. So if your child is in you know, full remote learning, please understand, I'm hopeful we move to phase five soon. If that happens in October, then remote learning will be gone. Full in-person learning will happen because the state still has mandatory attendance and they only recognize, I apologize, they only recognize student attendance that is in person if we move to phase five. Um, so as uh, another thing that I've gotten a lot of questions on is if I choose full remote learning, can my child still participate in extracurricular activities? As a full-time student in our school district, subject to the same grading eligibility and code of conduct as our in-person students, students who choose a full remote learning option are still able to access extra and co-curricular activities. Now, I would assume that if a parent is concerned about their child being at school because they're worried about contagion, then they probably wouldn't want them at football practice or wouldn't want them at basketball practice. Um, but they are still technically eligible because the state recognizes full remote learning as full student attendance. However, if a student submits a medical note as the reason to access remote learning, we will most likely require a release from the doctor to allow participation in any co or extracurricular activities. Um, so that's some more explanation that I think is very important. Everybody understand on a full remote learning option. So tentatively, here are the schedules for the buildings that we have set at this point. The early childhood center will have school from 745 to 1145 every day. The elementary school will have school from 810 to 1210. The intermediate school will be from 8 a.m. to noon the middle school from 8.20 to 12.30, and the high school from 8 o'clock to 12.15.
One of the pieces of feedback that we've received is the desire to have our middle school, high school kids out first so that they can be home to potentially provide childcare for younger students in the family. Uh, we have addressed that issue with our transportation company and we are still trying to see if that is a possibility. But right now, uh, this is the way the plan is due to transportation constraints. Um, a little bit more about the schedule at the high school and middle school. The high school and middle school is moving to a, what is essentially a four block schedule, which means the students will take four classes each semester. Um, the reason for that is if we end up in full remote learning down the road, our students only have four classes that they have to worry about, not eight. And so essentially all the A-day classes will be first semester, all the B-day classes will be second semester. Um, GAVC programs will still be held. I just uh, attended a GAVC board meeting today. GAVC has a schedule and all those programs will be held just on a shorter schedule. I would encourage you though, if you are choosing or considering a full remote learning option for your child, I would really encourage you to reconsider enrollment in certain GAVC programs. Um, we talked about that today at the GAVC board meeting. Programs like welding, building trades, those hands-on programs are just not an equivalent experience in a remote setting. And that's something that I think you need to be aware of and consider. Also at the high school, there are certain classes that we may not be offering to full remote learning students. For example, woods class at the high school, um, certain cooking classes at the high school. There are certain classes that don't lend well to uh, the remote learning idea. And so we wanna make sure that you're aware of that if you're considering the full remote learning option. Pre-K through five schedules have been adjusted. Um, they've adjusted their schedules to ensure the core curriculum is taught. Once we looked at the schedules, we are very pleased that we have not lost any time from the elementary core instruction. Um, we are able to still offer limited specials to our students and we are still able to offer PE, which is gonna be important for mask breaks for our students because when they're outside, we can socially distance and they don't have to wear a mask. Um, as I've already explained, teachers will receive uh, their lunch and plan periods in the afternoon, and that gives them the time necessary to complete their remote learning responsibilities for those students who choose full remote, as well as those students who are in remote learning due to temporary self-isolation. And that's going to happen throughout the year, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So let me give you some highlights of our three subcommittee reports. Um, our teaching and learning committee uh, it's a 14 page document that they had to put together to address all of the ISBE mandates and recommendations. Uh, we have a process in place for assessing the academic impact of the spring of 2020. We wanna make sure that if we have students that are behind because of remote learning in the spring, that we have a process for assessing that and develop a means to catch those students up. Uh, their plan also contains our remote learning expectations and remote learning contracts that I talked about earlier. One important thing in their plan is a recommendation which our district will be moving towards a true one-to-one -one environment, a technology environment, so that our students have access to a common device, uh, not only for their one hour of remote learning daily, but also for our students that choose the full remote learning option and for all of our students, if we end up having to go to full remote learning, if the state moves us back to um, phase three of the Restore Illinois plan. We still have some details and logistics that are being worked out. Um, for example, do we wanna send a Chromebook home with a kindergarten student back and forth every day? Or do we have something available for them in the classroom that they would use daily? Uh, those are still some logistics we're working on, but every student will have access uh, to a device. Um, based on parent survey feedback from last spring, one of the things we heard uh, a common theme from parents is that we had too many remote learning platforms. As a result of that, the Teaching and Learning Committee is recommending that our K through one teachers use Edlio and Class Dojo, and that our two through 12 teachers all use Edlio and Google Classroom so that we have a common platform. Um, 
We also had a facilities and operations committee, uh, a few highlights from their report. And this is where I wanna come back to masks again. One of the common misconceptions regarding schools is uh, because, and I understand it completely because it's the way it is in private business. In private business, you either stay six feet apart or you wear a mask. We don't have that option here. We are required under the State Board of Education to wear a mask and social distance whenever possible. The reason for that is that the State Board did not want the issue of social distancing to limit the students that could be in the building. Because obviously if we keep students strictly six feet apart in all of our classrooms, we aren't able to house all of our students with their existing teachers. So even if we're able to stay six feet apart in certain classrooms, our kids are, and adults are still required to wear face coverings. Um, we're going to try and follow social distancing as much as possible. We're clearing things out of our classrooms. We're making as much space as possible. We're providing hand sanitizer and other disinfecting supplies in each instructional space. I've already talked about that we've added an extra custodian in each building to help with cleaning. Um, offering optional remote learning, full remote learning for parents also helps with social distancing. Uh, we will have hallway markings and signage. Um, we're gonna be distributing entry and exits to maximize social distancing. I've had a lot of questions about transportation. The State Board of Education says we can still provide transportation, but we have to limit to 50 students per bus and the kids have to wear a mask. We've been working with our bus company and we believe we will be able to accommodate that. We're gonna be encouraging children from the same family to sit together to help with the social distancing issue. I've had a lot of questions about outside organizations using our facilities. Um, according to the IDPH guidelines, outside organizations can still utilize our facilities as long as they submit a plan on how they will implement all IDPH guidelines regarding the limit of 50 in a common space, social distancing and face masks. Another proactive step that our Board of Education has taken is we've hired two additional permanent subs in our district, which gives us four, or we've been, uh, we've been allowed to do that. We don't have them hired yet, but we are going to have four permanent sub positions to try to provide as much continuity as possible in case teachers have to, to uh, go under a mandatory uh, self-isolation due to any symptoms. Um, we are going to be purchasing a school issued face mask for each of our students. Um, this is what the school issued face mask will look like for our students. Uh, we are providing that for everyone. We are also going to be receiving extra face masks from the state of Illinois. Um, students, obviously we would love it if they wear the face mask. They are not required to wear our face mask. We want them to wear something that as a parent, you and their, your child believe is most comfortable for them. But these will be available if students need them uh, and we are providing them for our students. I've had a lot of questions about uh, what are you gonna do if, if a child takes his face mask off in class or takes his face mask off to blow his nose or we're not here to punish our kids. We're here to teach our kids. And yes, face masks are required. We have other uh, dress code requirements that our kids have to follow. And we are gonna work with our students, especially our youngest students, to help them understand the importance of that. This is not about punishment. It's about keeping our students as, and, and our faculty as safe as possible. Um, we have a health and wellness committee. The health and wellness considerations, and I wanna spend a little bit of time on this because there's been a lot of questions about what happens if my child has symptoms, what happens if my child is exposed? And I'll try to explain all of that. But first, uh, the Board of Education has also allowed us to hire additional staff so that we have a, either a full-time nurse or a full-time health aide in every one of our buildings. We also have been able to add additional staff to allow us to provide two full-time secretaries in each of our building to assist with parent phone calls, parent questions. Um, ISBE guidance does state that with a medical note, a student can be exempt from wearing a face mask at school. 
we will have a process to identify those students so that we know whether or not that student has a medical exemption. However, please understand, we would encourage parents with students in this situation that have a legitimate medical issue with the face mask to strongly consider the full remote option for the health and safety of the rest of our students and staff. Um, our administrators will work with you through that process, but I wanted everybody to know that that is contained in the ISBE guidance. Every one of our schools is going to have three rooms to address sick or potentially sick students. We have a triage room, we have a fever room, and we have a non-fever room to try to keep our kids as safe as possible. If we have more, two or more students from a single class that are sent home with COVID symptoms, not diagnosed with COVID, but COVID symptoms, we will be sending a letter home to the parents of the students in that class. All parents in our district will be informed if we have any confirmed COVID cases throughout the district, not just in a building, but throughout the district. Please remember, all HIPAA laws still apply. We are not able to release the names of any students or adults that may have uh, come up as COVID positive. Um, we talked before about symptom screenings that we have to do. Uh, we're still looking at what that process is going to look like, whether we will be able to have a self-screening process that parents at home can handle. So you're aware, the CDC and IDPH, which is referenced in the ISBE guidelines, has a number of COVID-19 symptoms. One is a fever of 100.4 or more, cough, chills, muscle aches, sore throat, runny nose, congestion, loss of taste or smell, nausea and or vomiting, diarrhea, shortness of breath, headache, and fatigue. If your child has any of these symptoms, we encourage you to contact our school so that we can help you with the process that you need to go through. And I'll explain that in a minute. We also, uh, we also know that students may have a runny nose for other reasons. Students and staff may present a medical note saying that they have allergies, hay fever, asthma, et cetera, and not necessarily automatically be sent home with symptoms such as a runny nose. So when does your child have to stay home? And I know this is a big question people have. This is set out right in the guidelines from the starting the 2021 school year. If a student tests positive for COVID-19, they are automatically isolated from school for 14 calendar days. That's if a student tests positive. This also holds for the adults in our building, but I'll just talk about students right now. So if a student tests positive, they have to stay for home for 14 days. If a student exhibits one or more of the symptoms I mentioned previously, they have to stay home for 14 days. If a student had close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, and close contact is defined by the IDPH as being within six feet of a symptomatic person for more than 15 minutes. So for example, if we have a student that tests positive for COVID-19 in a classroom, the only students that would be mandated to self-isolate would be any students that were within six feet of that student for more than 15 minutes. And I'll talk about contact tracing in a minute. If a student had close contact with someone who is exhibiting COVID-19 symptoms, they have to be excluded from school for 14, these are calendar days, remember not school days, calendar days. Once again, close contact means being within six feet of a symptomatic person for more than 15 minutes. So once again, if we have a student go home that is in a first grade classroom and we find out that the student had COVID-19 symptoms, we will do contact tracing to find out who was within six feet of that person for more than 15 minutes. And those students will have to isolate for 14 days as well. When students are self-isolating, they automatically move over to our remote learning process. So it's not like your students aren't gonna be taught during that time they automatically move to the full remote learning, which is once again, why it's so important that our teachers have that time in the afternoon to be able to address and work with those students. If a student has a temperature higher than 100.4, 
they have to stay home for, they have to be fever free for 72 hours before they can come back to school. If a student has a temperature higher than 100.4 and exhibits one or more symptoms of COVID-19, they have to stay home for 10 school days. The last one, which I wanna address because there's been a lot of misunderstanding on this. If a student has returned from a location with sustained widespread transmission, they have to stay home for 14 days. Now, right now, the IDPH, that, that's only if they're coming from an area that has a travel warning of level three as identified by the IDPH. Right now, the only areas that have a level three warning are China, Iran, Italy, and South Korea. Um, it's right on the IDPH web website. So if you take a vacation to Florida right now, um, and you do that two weeks before school starts, you are not required to isolate for that two weeks, or if you did it a week before school starts to isolate, unless that IDPH guidance changes and states are added to the travel warning of level three. Um, one of the things we are awaiting state guidance on is whether or not a student can return prior to completing self-isolation if they receive a medical release. So for example, if your child has COVID-19 symptoms, we would hope that you would get your child tested. If your child were tested and tested negative and a doctor wrote them a note saying it was okay for them to come back to school, we would like to get them back to school as soon as possible back in front of our teachers. But we have to make sure that that is going to be allowed. Um, contact tracing that I talked about, which are so important because we have to know who is within six feet of students for 15 minutes or more. When your kids are at school, they will have seating charts. Um, K through eight, we are going to have our students staying in their classroom almost most of the time and teachers will be the ones moving in and out of the classroom so the students are staying in one place. We'll have student sign out sheets, visitor logs, we're gonna do the best we can with our contact tracing procedures. Um, but we're still awaiting guidance on this whole medical release piece. Also on the uh, uh, health and wellness, there's a significant portion of that dedicated to the social emotional health of our students. We understand this has been difficult for our students for a number of reasons. We've had students that have lost athletic seasons. We've had students that have lost uh, concerts. We have students that have lost performances. Um, they're not around their friends all the time. It's been very, very tough. And so we're going to be keeping a very close watch on social emotional health of our students and uh, working collaboratively with our parents to make sure we meet those needs. I've received a lot of questions about extra and co-curricular activities. Right now, we are still awaiting IHSA and IESA guidance on whether or not fall seasons will happen. Um, once again, this is under the guidance of the IHSA. If the IHSA cancels fall seasons, then we won't have competitions. Uh, we received from the IESA today a communication that said they plan on making a decision no later than July the 24th. Uh, that's unfortunate because middle school softball is scheduled to start on the 27th. Um, I feel bad for our students that are sitting waiting for this, but it is really out of our control right now. And we are as anxious to get that guidance as anyone. So right now we are still working under the summer guidance from the IHSA uh, that allows us to work with our students, but we are, we are holding out hope for the fall season, but right now we don't know. I think what's important to understand as well even if our seasons are canceled, which we hope they're not, but if they are, there will be opportunities for students to participate either in person or remotely with their coaches and their teammates. It may not be competitions, but we are gonna do our best to keep our kids engaged in our activities because just we, because we don't have a soccer season doesn't mean we still don't have a soccer program. And just because we may not be able to have a fall play doesn't mean we still don't have a drama program. So we're, our, our teachers are dedicated, our coaches and sponsors are dedicated to continuing those opportunities with our students within the guidelines that we are going to be allowed. 
Um, I want to get to questions for the last few minutes here, but I just want to reinforce to everyone. Uh, I know this was a kind of quick, let's go through the plan. I understand that it's a complicated process. Um, once we gather some feedback, we are going to be posting more information on our website. Um, but please understand, this is all preliminary right now. Uh, it's not final until board approval. So your questions, your comments are, are going to be taken into consideration. I held a meeting with all of our faculty and staff this morning in a similar format and gave them the same opportunity. So we encourage you to ask those questions. So um, I wanna move now to try to answer the questions that have been submitted as best I can. And like I said, if there's any questions I can't get to, I will make sure that those are included in an FAQ document. I'm hopeful that the presentation I gave answered a lot of the questions that were already posed. One of the questions was, or a, a few questions have been asked about, will parents have the opportunity to be trained on whatever platform teachers will be using for remote learning? Google Classroom, Class Dojo, Edlio. Uh, yes, we will be providing links on our website with information on the various platforms being used. As I said in our teaching and learning committee report, based on feedback from the parents, we are really trying to limit the number of platforms that our teachers are using to make it not only easier for our students, but for the parents as well. Question on the after-school childcare. The after-school childcare that we are hoping to be, or we will be offering, we just don't know how many people are gonna take advantage of it and whether we will have to limit space or come up with a process, that will be free. Um, that childcare will be available from the time school is out until approximately between three and 3.30, depending on the dismissal time uh, of each building. After that, we will still have a uh, step-by-step that will be offering childcare at grades K through five for a charge for anyone who wants it in our building. So there will be childcare that's free during that time. Um, once again, just as a reminder for the childcare, the students will still have to wear a face mask. We will have adult supervision there. They can work on their remote learning assignment because they will have most likely have devices. Um, will buses run after childcare? No, we will not be running buses after childcare because we are also running a midday route for all of our kids now. So buses will not be running after childcare. Um, will masks be required if we move to phase five? I don't know the answer to that, but I assume the answer is no. Um, if we move to phase five, I would assume that the guidance coming from the state board would be that face masks will not be required. Will the 50 limits be lifted? I would assume they would. I don't make that decision. Our school district doesn't make that decision. But remember when we were in phase three, we were limited to 10. Phase four, we're limited to 50. Phase five, I would assume that those limits would be lifted. Um, when can parents expect to get the survey to select in-person or remote? Uh, the Board of Education meets on July the 20th to consider our plan, our proposed plan. If the board approves the plan, I would expect that the survey will come out a day or two later. And we will obviously give parents a week or so to consider everything, um, be able to carefully read our plan that's gonna be published on our website and make an informed decision. We're not trying to rush anyone. We understand this is a big decision for you and your family. We understand that every family's in different places on this issue. Um, and we wanna to try to accommodate as best we can. So that survey will be coming out. It's gonna be very important that all of our parents fill that survey out for their child. Because if we don't hear that you are going to participate in remote learning, we are assuming in-person learning. And so we do need you to make sure and fill that survey out. Um, the survey that we asked you to fill out back on June the 24th was not binding. That was just for us to get information for planning purposes. <clears throat> a question on will the transition self-contained special ed programs be treated like the general education programs? The uh, hybrid model of four hours in person and one hour remote is for all of our students, general education and special education. I had a question on when is the anticipated school start date? Right now, 
our calendar stands as we had originally approved earlier this year. Uh, um, staff comes on August the 17th and our students come on August the 18th. We do have a recommendation in our teaching and learning committee of the potential of using the 18th as a remote learning planning day for our teachers and our staff and potentially starting school on the 19th. We're gonna to try to get that finalized and that information out as soon as possible, but I am confident that we will be starting either the 18th or the 19th, as long as we are allowed to have in-person learning. Um, <clears throat> a question about screenings on entry and self-certification for all staff and students daily. Once again, we're, we're waiting for a little bit more guidance on this issue. We are hopeful that there is going to be a self-certification process. We don't know what that's going to look like yet. So if you have a child in school and you, you will have the opportunity to go through a self-certification process, if it's approved by the state, that you can fill out a form. We'll have an electronic form, we think, that you would be able to fill out and say, my child has none of these symptoms. They're good for school today. And then your child will be able to come into school. If, you don't, if we don't have a self-certification format, we are gonna be required to take every student and adult's temperature that comes into the building and have a format to ask them the questions on whether they have any of those symptoms. That's one of the mandates from the state. So um, we're still waiting on more guidance about that, but more to come. Uh, questions on GAVC. Uh, once again, I, I tried to address this earlier, but GAVC is going to be holding their programs. Uh, they're going to be on a shortened schedule for students. Um, I think recently some other Grundy County students have some, or under other Grundy County districts, there's four feeder districts that are coming into GAVC, have submitted their plans, and I believe all of them are on a partial day model. So GAVC is going to be running a partial day. Um, in terms of specific plans for certain programs, uh, I believe that all the programs are planning on running. Once again, I would encourage you, if you want a full remote learning option for your child, to reconsider certain GAVC programs, such as um, building trades, welding, um, potentially even cosmetology, some other areas depending on where your child is in that program. Obviously, if your child's in the second year of a cosmetology program, we want them to be able to finish that program. Um, so there's gonna be more to come on that, but the plan is that we will be able to accommodate GABC classes. So once again, uh, I wanna thank everyone for uh, tuning in tonight uh, to hear this virtual town hall meeting. Um, in closing, I do want to reiterate to everyone that we understand the fact that this is a stressful time and an anxious time. Um, we are never going to be able to put a plan together that makes everyone happy. Uh, what we tried to do is put a plan together that met as many needs for as many of our parents and students as possible. And what we tried to do in our plan is show compassion and understanding for the different places that parents, students, and their families are at right now. The challenge in this upcoming year is for all of us inside and outside the organization to remain as positive as possible. School's going to look different. And that's not hard just for our students, it's hard for our parents, and it's hard for the entire community. What we have to do is focus on the positives and understand that we get, our, we get to have our kids back at school. That's what we're excited about. Um, we have to focus on the positives and we can't let the negatives control your outlook or the experience your child has in school. Um, like I said, we get to have our kids in school. Those that choose in-person learning, we get to get them back into a routine again. Those of you that are choosing a full remote learning option, we hope to have your child back in school soon. Um, we're gonna continue no matter which option you choose to provide the best possible educational experience for your students. And with your help, I still believe that we can have a very good school year. I wanna remind everyone, um, 
the plan that I put in front of you, once again, is subject to state changes. So even if the board approves the plan on the 20th, if something changes at the state level and mandates change, we're gonna have to go back and alter our plan accordingly. But we are very, very hopeful that things stay stable and we are allowed to offer in-person instruction to any student that wants it. I think as you uh, go through this school year, all of us inside and outside the organization and throughout the community, and I told this to our faculty and staff this morning, I think there are three words that we all need to remember this school year. Patience, flexibility, and understanding. We have to have an understanding for other people's opinions, where other people are at, and understand that everybody inside and outside the organization is doing what they believe is best for their child. And we respect that. Please be assured that everyone in our school district community and our communities are gonna continue to do the best we can for your kids. I would encourage you if you have further questions after this to continue to submit via the online form. We will be posting an FAQ document for any questions that are submitted after this presentation. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've never been more proud to be a Kohler than I am right now. Everyone's pulling together and we're gonna have a good school year for your kids. Thank you.